It's uh, a great pleasure to rise in support of the bill by my honourable colleague from uh, Bulkley Skeena. This is a historic bill, and I'm so, so proud to rise in support of it. it it's called an Act to Defend the Pacific Northwest, and I think I, a better name could not be given to this initiative. But I want to say, Mr. Speaker, when I ran now exactly two years ago, I knocked on many doors in Victoria and Oak Bay in my part of Vancouver Island. I met so many different people, but not one person did I meet in my constituency who supported the Enbridge Northern Gateway project, not a single one. They all were fearful of what it would do to our beautiful coast and what the, First Na the impact on First Nation communities would be. So what this bill does today, Mr. Speaker, is codify that resistance that this particular bill has, that codify that resistance that British Columbians have. And I believe that that's what's central to this initiative. The first thing, however, I want to say is how shocked and delighted I was a moment ago to hear the Parliamentary Secretary for Natural Resources rise in this place and say something quite remarkable. She concluded her remarks by saying that this bill is, and I quote, redundant. So I went and looked in the dictionary, and I saw in Google, of course, where we all look for definitions of words, that means it's not or no longer needed or superfluous. So I guess what she is saying then, on behalf of the Conservative government, is that a ban on oil tankers, VLCCs in the Pacific Northwest, is unnecessary because it's already there. Now, I did not know that. I'm delighted to hear that. It shows that the Conservatives actually have thought about what the impact of a spill would be in this particular part of the world. And I, I was delighted to learn that they've accepted that. So, Mr. Speaker, maybe it's not necessary, and if we could therefore simply agree to those conditions, that would be great. But, Mr. Speaker, this bill goes beyond that quite substantially. It would force pipeline proponents to look at adding value to resources and creating jobs in Canada by amendments to the NEB Act, something I would, I would commend. And most significantly, perhaps, given the cases, the Chilcotin case and other cases in our courts, it would strengthen consultations between the federal government and First Nation communities at pipeline reviews. Of course, it would do that for all municipalities, as my friend has suggested, but it would go, of course, much beyond that in light of the new obligations that face uh, all of us as we deal with First Nations in, in resource development contents, context. So for us, Mr. Speaker, this is a common sense initiative that would put the environment and First Nations back at centrally into the energy conversation and make sure that Canadians are getting full benefit for energy development. Um, so I want, I want to say in particular that the bill would stop Enbridge Northern Gateway in its tracks. I feel, Mr. Speaker, that I have a mandate to represent the people who sent me here, all of whom are opposed to this, and therefore I think this bill, redundant though it may be, would definitely put a nail through the heart of that egregious uh, egregious project which so, so few people in my part of the world think has any sense at all. It's grotesque, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I think it's inspired by the experience of Northwest BC and its fight against Enbridge that the Bill C-628 would legislate immediate protections for the pristine North Coast from threats from these oil tankers while addressing the key concerns raised by the poor process that led the Conservative government to approve the pipeline. Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud to have been the past co-chair of the Environmental Law Centre at the University of Victoria. Those people are now in court fighting the NEB decision and the government's decision to accept the JRP's report because of its, the numerous procedural errors that are so patent, patently obvious to any lawyer who's examined them. And I think this would go some distance if Bill 628 were to be accepted uh, to address some of the deficiencies that were, were, that were so made so apparent during that process. A process where literally thousands of people appeared, 99 point whatever percent of whom opposed this pipeline. Yet nevertheless, three individuals appointed by the NEB came to British Columbia and said, we know what's best, we'll go ahead and recommend approval for this project. Nobody. Nobody in our community takes seriously that process. Nobody takes it seriously in the Kinder Morgan process. If this bill would go some distance to improve it, then I think it's worth it for sure on that basis alone. 300 scientists from around the world condemned that joint review panel project full of errors and omissions. 
and said it cannot be used to make decisions about uh, pipelines and demanded the government finally say no to the lunacy of the Enbridge Northern Gateway pipeline proposal. Um, you know, and what's happening, Mr. Speaker, as recently as in today's Globe and Mail, is we see a change in the economy. Green energy sector jobs now total, they, they, they surpass the total of, of oil sands employment in this country. There's six and a half million people employed now in the clean energy sector, according to Clean Energy Canada in a report released today. Twenty-five billion has been in invested in Canada's clean energy sector in the past five years. And as I say, more people are employed in this sector than in the oil sands. The world has changed, the Conservatives have not, and projects like Enbridge Northern Gateway show how much they have their head in the sand, perhaps I should say in the oil sands. So, Mr. Speaker, I had a constituent, Dr. Gerald Graham, who worked, uh, with, works with World Ocean Consulting, and he calculated that over a 50-year period, the chance of a major tanker spill is somewhere between 8.7 and 14.1 percent. These are the same odds at the top end as Russian roulette. Applying a standard model used by governments to project spill risk, researchers at Simon Fraser University have estimated the Northern Gateway Pipeline would generate a tanker spill somewhere between every 23 and 196 years, a terminal spill every 15 to 41 years, and 15 or 16 pipeline spills on land every year. Overall, they peg the probability of a tanker spill at 90%. And yet the Joint Review Panel said, quote, a large spill is unlikely, or, end quote, a large spill would initially have significant adverse environmental effects, but the environment would ultimately recover. Tell that to First Nations people who depend on the sea in the northwest part of British Columbia. Tell that to the municipalities, like Kitimat, that despite propaganda from the Enbridge company decided to vote against even allowing that project in their, in their community. They've spoken. The Conservatives have certainly not listened. I could go on and talk about the lunacy of a report that said Dilbit may not even sink. I didn't know that. Tell that to the people in Kalamazoo, Michigan. They spent over a billion dollars trying to clean up something on the bottom of the Kalamazoo River, but I guess it doesn't sink. There must have been a lot of, a lot of wasted money. Oh no, it says it's the, when it gets to the waves and in seawater, it's an entirely different issue. Well, Mr. Speaker, the scientists with whom I've consulted think the report's conclusion on such a central issue was itself lunacy. And of course, we're playing Russian roulette, as I said earlier, with the fate of some of the most beautiful part of our planet and some of the most dangerous waters on our planet when one thinks of Hecate Strait and Douglas Channel with 90 degree turns out to the ocean. If you look at a map that Enbridge gave, those islands don't exist apparently, but I've seen them. I've been there many times. It's my favorite part of this planet, and I will not let the Conservatives destroy it by allowing this pipeline and these tankers to go through this part of the world. So in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, I've been an environmental lawyer for most of my life. I've, I've participated in many hearings. I've been commissioned counsel on environmental assessment projects myself. This project was flawed from the get-go. The process was, in, was just so inadequate that everyone has spoken against it. The same people are now speaking out about the process that's facing the Kinder Morgan process in British Columbia. I'm proud to stand here in support of my colleague for introducing this bill. We were lucky to have him in this house. He was in my riding a couple of weeks ago. Several hundred more people take back our coast is what he calls it. Had a, several hundred a year or so ago, several hundred now. We're not going away. Our resistance to this project, we're only getting started, Mr. Speaker. This bill will make an enormous difference to how we do business in Canada in addressing these kind of projects. I commend my colleague for this initiative, and I hope all members of this House will support it. Thank you very much.